fire from heaven. Boy, that better be a good sermon. Of course, the best sermons are usually the ones that people don't like. Once I, I preached a sermon that was called An Inconvenient Sermon. It was way back when uh, Al Gore's movie was popular. And the elder of my church, he, he, he said that they should all be inconvenient, which is very true. You can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. So we've been living here for 16 months about now, and it's a, it's a scary thing when you make a big life change. You make a decision that, you know, you're just going in a different direction, and you can doubt so easily. You can get, like, a couple months down the road, and you're there, like, Am I in the right place? There are going to be many times in your life when you have to make a decision. You know, take this job, move here, uh, pursue this relationship. And as you make these decisions, there is, you know, you should be trying to make a godly decision. But there's one thing that I should, I'm going to warn you about, and we're going to see it in this passage. So I've been here for 16 months, and, and about a month in, I was really sort of doubting, like, boy, was this a great decision? After all, my house that I still hadn't sold back in Manitoba had now two feet of water in the basement because we got 14 inches of rain and the power went out. So the sub pump wasn't pumping any water, and uh, then I had to try to sell this house that had just gotten water in the basement. There was, a, there was a young man that I knew once, and it was in my old church, and he had lived kind of a, kind of a hard life, and he had decided that he was going to start following Christ. You know, his, his dad was Christian, so he started coming to church, and he, and he was working at following Christ, and he came to me about three months later. You know, I, I was talking to him. He hadn't been in church in about two weeks. I came, and I, I was like, you know, hey, what's going on? And he told me, since I started following Christ, everything has gotten harder for me. So what am I doing here? If we go through life, just go doing what is easiest you're just like water you know you're flowing and wherever the lowest place you just kind of flow to you get used to in the moment you're just doing what's easiest compared to that following christ may seem very difficult and yet jesus did warn us about the broad way that leads to destruction all right, let's look at the Bible. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up. Oh, I should probably be like clicking this thing. <laughs> Thanks. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. It's actually cool here because he... Uh, when the days drew near, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and it's literally, and he sent messengers ahead of his face, which is uh, a way they talk about his presence, but he sent messengers ahead of his face who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. 
and they went on to another village. Okay. Oh, I actually, this is the verse I was trying to be on. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Verse 51. Now we're back into the gospel of Luke and it's exciting to get back here. I know people, they come and tell me and they're like, boy, I really like that topical series. And topical series are really fun because you get right into kind of nitty gritty. They're really applicable because they're kind of, they start with the application. Like we're going to talk about how we communicate. We teach you how you communicate. And those are all really great. What I don't like is generally in a topical series, I'm telling you what I know about the Bible. But when we go line by line through a text is when I get to discover what's in the Bible, and share with you the discovery. And I really like the sharing with you the discovery. So generally, this is how it's going to go. We're going to go mostly through books of the Bible, and then we're going to have topical series like, like two or three interspaced in, in, in a year, something like that. All right, he set his face to go to Jerusalem when the days drew near for him to be taken up. And so this is putting the focus here when he's taken up. This is Jesus is going to leave. It spoke before in the first part when he's speaking with Moses on the mountain that he's looking forward to his exodus, which he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. And so this taking up is referred to both Jesus going up on the cross and his ascension into heaven. Jesus looks at this coming time when he is going to suffer and be crucified and he decides right at this point which is halfway through luke's gospel that he is setting his face towards it this is now his direction it is his goal and so you can read the whole rest of luke's narrative as kind of a step-by-step -step death march to jerusalem he is headed towards the cross. This is his purpose. Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem for three reasons. One is that it draws our attention to the cross. Jesus taught and he healed, but he came to do the one thing that only he could do, which was die for the sins of his people. Second, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. This is the city of David, the seat of political power, where the king would rule. And yes, he is the king. of The king, he is the son of David. He would go into Jerusalem with cries of Hosanna. And yet, his throne would not be a marble throne of beauty with gems, but it would be a wooden cross. That would be where he would rule. He sets his face to go to Jerusalem to show us that the cross is not a cosmic accident, but his purpose. He is going there to accomplish this thing. It wasn't plan B. He didn't get there and be like, well, no, they didn't accept me. Now I'm going to die. No, he set his face to go there and be taken up from the beginning. And four, he sets his face to go to Jerusalem, teaching us that God's will is hard, but it's good for all those who follow him. The suffering of the cross has permeated this chapter, and it's going to flow through the rest of Luke's gospel. Luke 9, 23, it says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so this journey to Jerusalem is not a journey that he is accomplishing alone, but setting a pattern for his disciples to take up their cross and follow him. 
Now in this journey to go from Galilee, which all of his ministry has been up in Galilee, and he's going to go down to Jerusalem. Between Galilee and Jerusalem is a region called Samaria, where the, you can guess it, the Samaritans live. Now the Samaritans and the Jewish people, they don't get along. They are kind of enemies. They kind of the Samaritan people aren't really Jewish. If you read in 2 Kings, you can see that they were the Assyrians when they took over northern Israel. They took people from other places, brought them there, and the people there were getting eaten by lions. And nobody likes to get eaten by lions. And they were like, well, we are not worshiping the right God. And so then they started worshiping the God of Israel so they wouldn't get eaten by lions. And things went a little better for them. But... Because they weren't really Jewish, they're always butting heads with the Jewish people of the land. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim. They were actually awaiting a savior, a kind of Messiah, who would appear suddenly on Mount Gerizim. Something that Jesus probably himself accomplishes in John chapter 4. They did follow the five books of Moses. So... Most Jews hated the Samaritans so much that they would go the long way around and not go through Samaria, but Jesus was more practical and heads right for the Samaritan city. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Okay, so if I say the word Samaritan, what is the first word that comes into your mind? Good, yes, good. We know the good Samaritan. It's a, the most famous parable that involves a Samaritan. We're going to get to it in about two chapters. But these are the bad Samaritans. Because they're like, hey, you know, do you have room for Jesus to come? And they're like, no, we have no room for Jesus to come. Do you have room tomorrow? No, we have no room tomorrow. Will you have a room anytime? No, we never have any room for Jesus. Giving hospitality to travelers was a requirement of the law. Exodus 22, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. They rudely reject Jesus. And it's, it's a little hard to know why here. Because you get the impression, you know, they didn't like Jewish people. That's the most sensible thing. But the text itself says they didn't accept him because the people did not ex receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And I think what this is getting at here is that in the moment they rejected Jesus for some reason. But the ultimate reason was that Jesus' purpose was not going to be good to go to this town and preach the gospel. His ultimate purpose was to go to Jerusalem, where he was going to die for the sins of his people. Jesus, Jesus, this is so instructive for us, because Jesus here is setting out his plan he's like okay we're gonna go to jerusalem this is our new purpose we're heading there and the first thing he does is send out some people so that they are their first stay can be in this town along the path and it fails they're like no you can't stay here and so jesus when he starts out his new thing following perfectly in the will of god the first thing he's met with is a closed door. Now, this is a difficult path. You know, they probably have to walk longer or something because where they were going to stay is not is denied to them because of their ethnicity. But this hard way is exactly the way that God intends for Jesus to walk. This is instructive for us because when we see Jesus, you know, in his plans and it just not starting out well, is that when we make a decision and we start walking in it and it turns out that it's hard, we should not take this as a sign that we are on the wrong path. In fact, it might very well be the opposite. It reminds me of my friend, you know, he starts out following Christ and he's just like, man, this is hard. 
Following Jesus is not a ticket to a life of ease. It's a ticket to doing what is good, what is ultimately satisfying, what will ultimately lead to your most full and satisfied life. But it's not immediately easy. We should expect hard things. Because we are following a Savior that not only had a difficult destination, but had a rocky road to get there. Even on the first step, the first thing he did was hard. Someday, someday, maybe very soon, being a Christian will not be so easy. I think about a lot of the First Nations believers that I talk to, like it hasn't been easy for them for a long time. There's a lot of cultural difficulty that comes from following Christ. And if you're just here because it's the easy thing to do, that is going to go away. And so you need to decide, are you doing what is easy? Or are you going to pursue with everything you have what is good in your life? And if Jesus was more like us, you know, he gets it, he starts going out and it's just like, hits this first hard path and be like, man, you know, maybe, I'm, maybe I should go a different way. But so often like Jesus here. And you get, you know, you follow on to Luke's next book into Acts. You see James and John, they're up preaching the gospel. They get thrown in jail. <laughs> you see Paul, who's out there and he's like preaching the gospel. He's going to Jerusalem. He gets arrested. He gets beaten. He gets thrown in prison. He gets put on a ship, which then gets shipwrecked onto an island, crawls to the beach after suffering for many days, gets to a fire, and gets bit by a snake. That's always like the moment. It's like, like how much more can you suffer bit by a snake? If we're doing the right thing and it's hard, don't take the hardness of the road as a sign that you're on the wrong track. Maybe it's a sign you're on the right one. Okay, so this story isn't the most memorable because he got turned down by the uh, bad Samaritans. It's memorable for the next line. Because when they got rejected from this town, his disciples, James and John, saw it. They said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire, or like speak fire, to come down from heaven and consume them? Now, the first question is, where in the world did James and John get this idea? You know, they're going, you know, Jesus had just put the child, be like, you know, you should be like a child. And they're like, you know what would be a good idea? Burn them with fire! Fire from heaven! Second question. How in the world did Peter not think of this first? I mean, Peter's always the one who's always like saying, you know, I can imagine, you know, many years later, Peter going to be like, <laughs> remember James and John that one time that you guys were really wrong? And they're like, yeah, but like the other 30 times with you. No, but that one time, you guys were really in the wrong. You know, maybe this is why they got their nickname, the Sons of Thunder. They were ready to call down the thunder. So they, they got this idea from the Bible. Like this isn't totally crazy in 2 Kings chapter 1, second 2 Kings reference today. 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah, man of God, he's up on the mountain and Ahab wants to speak to him, sends a captain with 50 men and the guys, they go and they're like, Ahab would like to see you. And he's like, if, you, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume them. And fire from heaven burns them all up. 50 more people come and more fire. And finally, the last guy comes, and he's like, please spare my life. He just, like, throws himself down. It's a great story. You can go look it up. Second Kings chapter 1, kids, it's a great one. So they think, like, Jesus has just said that he is the Messiah. They're not really listening about the suffering thing. They think they're going on to, 
to Jerusalem to claim the throne with power, and anyone who stands in their way is going to meet with a blazing, fiery end. <sighs> and yet, Jesus wants to teach them something different. It may seem like rather you know, far off, calling down fire from heaven on people, and yet, all over, there are Christians day by day who will tell you that having power is the only means to, God, to fulfilling God's will. Whether it's marching into the capital to overthrow the government or in any of the small ways where we think we need to be popular. We need to be the ones on top to make things happen. Jesus shows a different way. He turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Calling down fire from heaven is a bad idea here because, one, they're not called to bring judgment onto the world at that time. And we aren't either. You know, it might not be in your power or idea that you want to have to, you know, call down fire to burn your neighbor's house because he looked at you funny. It's probably not a good idea. But we can go through life dealing out this kind of judgment in big and small ways, turning down our noses at people, giving a stiff shoulder, because we feel like they are bad and it is our job to punish them. But it's not. Second, we want to see everyone around us as created in the image of God as a person that God wishes to save. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing any should perish, but it all should reach repentance. Look not on people who slight you, not as someone to judge, but as someone whom God wishes to save. And finally, three, while Jesus rebukes them, there will be a time of fire and judgment. Luke 17, not too much further, Jesus says, but on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven, heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus will bring judgment at the right time. We are not the judge. So we can fight the urge to judge in three ways. One, know that God is working through this person whom you want to judge or punish in some way, in order to bring out our ultimate good. Now, if we're on the right path, it's often hard. And just like Jesus, as he was hindered by these Samaritans, by them not welcoming him, it was ultimately moving, moving him in the way that God wanted him to go. It was a hard way, but it was a good way. And in the same way, when hard things come upon us, this is one of the means that God is using to sanctify us, that God is using to move us forward into a good way, even though it's hard. Instead of calling down wrath, we can seek forgiveness and reconciliation with those who are close to us. And if it's somebody we don't know, we can just be like Jesus. Be like, okay, we're just going to go to the next village. We can just let this be. Second, we can dwell on the fact that each person is a person that God wishes to save. And so, instead of our anger wanting to inflict punishment or wrath on this person, we see this as a person created in God's image that is broken and needs reconciliation with God. And you know what? It's an amazing thing because Jesus is like, no, we're not going to call down fire on this Samaritan village. I know we don't like the Samaritans. I know they didn't let us in. But if you keep reading... In Luke's work into Acts, you get to the middle of Acts and what happens there? There is a great revival of people coming to know Jesus in the Samaritans. And who knows if it's the same town, but maybe some of these people that they wanted to be burned up were the very people who are going to come to know Jesus later on. Who knows what's going to happen? And three... When we are slighted, instead of punishing and anger, we can know that, yes, Jesus will judge justly. 
We don't have to deal out punishment in the world because Jesus will bring the fire in his time and it is a way that is actually just and righteous. We can even let our enemies win because we know that God holds all the cards. He will bring the justice either through salvation in Jesus Christ or punishment of the sinner in hell. So, summary. Jesus gets rejected, but his disciples are not to judge. When things get hard, when things don't go our way, don't take it as a sign you're on the wrong path. Our actions should only be judged by the word of God and the Holy Spirit not by whether it's easy or hard. We are not called to judge the world, but to proclaim that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. 